Advancements in technology, such as machine learning, AI, have now become common buzzwords in the supply chain industry. This provokes questions. Can machine learning be applied in a way that, by providing in more and more forecast-relevant data, it produces better forecasts? Can machine learning produce even better decisions than humans? Or is there a risk that, by providing it more data that it learns from, that these feedback loops essentially become a self-fulfilling prophecy? These are the topics of today's discussion, and we are very lucky to welcome Alexander Bacchus with us here today at our offices. Alexander is an expert in this field and is the data and analytics leader at IKEA. So as always, we'd like to start off by letting our guests introduce themselves. So Alexander, if you wish, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Thanks for having me here. Great to be here in Paris with you. Uh, so yeah, my name is Alexander Bacchus, and I am leading data analytics in the uh, inventory and logistics operations domain of uh, IKEA, uh, Inca Group Digital. And uh, I'm managing a group of data scientists, data engineers, and data analysts uh, working in cross-functional product teams on a mission to um, optimize uh, inventory and logistics operations planning. Um, I have a background in data science, uh, so I worked as a consultant for big companies like KLM Airlines, Heineken, Vodafone, Zego, ING Bank, uh, and uh, after doing a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. Um, I think uh, working in supply chain uh, as a data scientist is, is a really uh, exciting field uh, because it combines a lot of favorable conditions uh, from, uh, that for data science. There's a lot of data. Uh, there is uh, impact on real-world decision-making, so it's something tangible. Uh, and you don't impact only the bottom line, but also have a more sustainable world by reducing waste in supply chain. So that's how I ended up here. And before we dwell into these topics, uh, let's first explain the concept that we will be discussing. Um, so let's just start off. What is a self-fulfilling prophecy? Yeah, so the idea is that um, uh, the forecast that you make, so if you want to forecast your, your business process to optimize it, mm -hmm. that this forecast actually impacts a, a, a certain decision-making process. So there's a decision being made based upon your forecast. At least that's what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and when that happens, that means that your forecast itself is changing the future. And it's also changing its own sort of the, the, the data that is being used to forecast the next time. And, and that is, uh, yeah, that can be, uh, that can pose, uh, pose certain challenges, actually. So essentially a self-fulfilling prophecy is when a prediction happens because it was predicted. So essentially you affect the future because you thought it would be a certain way. Yeah, you're not, oh, you're sort of not only affecting the future, but you also sort of, yeah, in, in a way, even making, uh, in reality that mm -hmm. the forecast will be sort of the truth and that can that mm -hmm. can happen in sort of uh, various ways so for example if you um, have a forecast of, of your business of your sales for instance mm -hmm. uh, then this can become the target for your business mm -hmm. so then uh, marketing people they make certain decisions they say uh, okay we should uh, reach this target because we're a bit low now so we need to, need to sell a bit mm -hmm. more and we need to do some promotions so actually the forecast that you made that has become the target that has sort of led to decision making along the way mm -hmm. that impacts actually what will be the end result uh, of sales in this, mm -hmm. in this example. And, th and that, that, that can happen in many ways. So another example is where you uh, will have a certain uh, a forecast that, that makes it such that you uh, secure a, a given delivery capacity or picking capacity in your warehouses. Uh, and that uh, has an impact on the lead time. So when a customer mm -hmm. looks at your, your e-commerce uh, website, and you sort of see that the lead time is is is, uh, is is very high, for instance, or very low. It can go either way. Mm -hmm. Then that actually influences the demand. The customer as well. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. customer so may change their decision. They change their decision mm -hmm. exactly. So it's that your 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 uh, yeah demand influences mm -hmm. supply and supply influences demand. So it goes mm -hmm. goes either way. And uh, yeah, so that, that is actually this, this sort of um, effect that you, mm -hmm. you were hinting at. And Jonas, when it comes to the forecast that become business targets, uh, what else do you, how do you see that affect the business itself? What is the drawbacks when the forecast is sort of something people aim to reach rather than actually looking at their supply chain performance? Um, there is no, I would say, 
drawbacks per se. It is more a, a matter of this is the way supply chain operates. You know, feedback loops are all over the place. Mm. Um, we are dealing with essentially human affairs. And where it surprised, uh, I would say, uh, practitioners is that um, in, I would say, um, in many engineering schools and even in many companies, people approach forecasting like, uh, like the approach, I would say, the forecast of the movement of planets. You know, something where um, you have a very clean framework where you have um, past observation and you can, you know, make a statement about the future position of the planet, but uh, you being the forecaster mm -hmm. has no impact whatsoever mm -hmm. on those on, 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 on those elements being observed, like the planets. So you mean to say that a self-fulfilling prophecy is not necessarily good or bad, it's just is. Yes, so exactly. you can't it, pretend that it, it doesn't affect. But it certainly makes the world situation more um, complex, yeah. complicated, I, I, mm -hmm. at least, actually a bit of both. And, um, and so the, where it becomes a little bit puzzling is that many companies have, I would say, a hard time to come to terms with anything that is not a point forecast. So a point forecast, say you have like one future, this is it. Uh, and it is essentially um, something that is completely the symmetric of the past. You know, you have your past observation, you would like to have the future that is just as clean and neat mm -hmm. As uh, as a past, that that's essentially a more point of forecast. the same. Um, yes, more of the same, but also really the same the same nature. So you you have like a, a a perfectly clear vision about the past and a perfectly clear vision about the future. And by the way, in the case of the movement of planets, as long as you're not you know looking millions of years ahead, you can have like a a, a mm -hmm. completely perfect vision for the position of those planets one century from now. Now, where it becomes kind of interesting is that in supply chain, you have feedback looks all over the place. Whenever you are committing yourself to a product by buying a lot, then indeed you create expectation and, and, and then uh, people feel that they have to sell the product and they will do whatever it takes so that indeed mm -hmm. uh, the company is not left with massive overstock that they have not managed to push. So they will organize themselves so mm -hmm. that this massive supply transform into a massive mm -hmm. sale, or at least you know that's what they will try They're to achieve. They're going to adjust the price according to how much they have in stock. Uh, or sometimes s things that are even more mundane. Uh, they would just if there if there is stores, if you have a large amount of stock for a given product, you would just put this product front and center. You would put it into a gondola, mm -hmm. uh, and if you have like a massive amount of stock, if you have like a brochure the product is going to be on the first page of the brochure. Mm -hmm. It's not just the price. I mean, yes, the price is something that can help, but it can also be things that are much more mundane is that what do you put for what? And again, it, all is, um, it is always a matter of comparison with the other products that you're yeah. having. If you have one product where you have, you have a lot more stock than the others, then it feels very natural for a store owner, store manager mm -hmm. to put this product forward. Uh, but but also uh, it creates also expectations with uh, um, with the competition, for example. The competition also look at what you're doing, and if you're pushing very very strongly in one direction, the competitor might actually decide that they are going to mm -hmm. go uh, in a slightly different dif direction just to establish a, a bigger differentiation. So you see those feedback feedback loops; they are all over the place and. They are not bad. They are just mm -hmm. they are, they are just present. And again, the core reason it's because in the middle we have humans that can think and act based on on those announcements about the future. Mm -hmm. So whenever there is whenever you have humans in the loop, whenever you're making a statement about those future about the future, people are going to react according to the statements. Supply chains are very complex, so the, those mm -hmm. reactions can take you know many sort of forms. But all supply chains have in common of having like plenty mm -hmm. of people, mm -hmm. and and sometimes, for example, the feedback loop also takes the form of um, if you announce that there will be a shortage of something, then people rush to buy this something, and so you, it, and it can be really a man-made shortage just because like a psychological effect. Of, but you're going to lose out on this exactly, you and mm -hmm. um, so this is. And, and the idea that if you announce a shortage, that, that you're most likely going to cause a shortage, mm. it's nothing new. You know, it's uh, it's it's relatively 
predictable, but nonetheless, it is difficult to kind of anticipate all mm -hmm. those data clues because so suddenly you have to, affect, yes, sure. and mm -hmm. suddenly you have to kind of model in a way the psyche of the people who are, you know, in the middle of the supply chain. Uh, Janice, you keep mentioning these feedback loops. Um, Alexander, may I ask you, what actual data is fed back into these systems for our viewers to understand? So at what point in the, say, supply chain do we feed the, the data back? Yeah, yeah, so uh, good question. So I think uh, one sort of uh, very important source for, for doing any type of forecast is, is your sales data. And yeah. this is also the key data that is affected by the effects that we just sort of uh, mm -hmm. talked about. So if we go back to what Johannes was explaining as well, the mm -hmm. sort of naive approach to, or the sort of basic approach to demand forecasting, or forecasting, business forecasting mm -hmm. in general, is where you take a, a, a supervised uh, machine learning model and you start sort of uh, treating it as a, a basic regression problem. So you say, okay, I'm just going to predict this quantity based on historical data mm -hmm. using a supervised learning algorithm. And then if you take that, that model that is trained sort of to predict future sales, and now we think back about the examples of the feedback loops that we uh, discussed, uh, then you can have sort of uh, detrimental uh, or degenerate cases here. So where you sort of, your model predicts a low demand or low sales in this uh, let's 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 be very uh, cautious and not confusing yeah. the two but let's let's ignore for a moment that's mm -hmm. sales is not demand but uh, um, it will sort of get you you will have uh, you you predict low sales so you also do low uh, capacity planning mm -hmm. and therefore you also sell less and then you will go down and down and down and down until you get zero. So the model will start to learn that low... Uh, the demand is falling, but is in falling. reality yeah, it's your yeah. And it can go also the other way around, actually. So it can also uh, spiral up in that sense. So you have, uh, yeah, so there, there, there's, uh, there's this, this sort of uh, detrimental effects if you use a machine learning model to learn from history to predict the future mm -hmm. in this sort of more naive way that uh, that you can go completely wrong here kind of sounds like the a bullwhip effect where and sort of a mistake in the supply chain or a deviation from the norm just gets amplified by the system and you also mentioned the fact that sales is not necessarily demand because you may sell 50 units of your stock but if that's your whole stock if the demand was yeah. 100 it will still only register that your sales yeah. was 50. And that, 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 that distinction is actually to, to the core of this, related to the core of this mm -hmm. problem, but uh, it's uh, uh, demand itself is of course an unobserved quantity. Yeah. You, cannot, yeah. you cannot measure it, so you need to infer it. And uh, yeah, the sales data is sort of the closest to that, but mm -hmm. that's definitely not the whole picture. Yeah. And the man is surely also influenced by the supply, not just what is what you're able to sell, but essentially like saying fashion, uh, it's the what is presented for the customer that also influences their willingness to yeah. buy it. Yeah, and then so we can yeah. get back to the, this idea that the forecast that you produce, they get, they they cause a certain decision mm -hmm. and effect that influences demand in the end or, and sales as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, then uh, th that that is this feedback loop. And I heard someone describe it aptly as the uh, the difference between uh, predicting the weather and predicting the business. Yeah, is that the weather you can you can you can finally predict uh, using the approach, the more naive sort of regression approach. But that doesn't affect the weather. Yeah, the that, that the doesn't day. affect the weather, yeah. no, at least not in, in, in any conceivable way at this uh, point in history. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, but that's your, the business, you actually want them to act. So we mm -hmm. discussed that before, yeah. So like you mentioned, if we have a machine learning model that just learns from its own essentially data that it outputs and that way kind of amplifies the deviation from the norm and then say if it sees the demand dropped a little bit for whatever reason it will tell the system oh we should in fact order less and yeah. essentially demand drops even more because you ordered less and hence as the demand drop we should order even less even less even less yeah. end up with zero so we get this kind of zero forecasting problem which i'm assuming is you know, especially the case when we do use time series uh, forecast. Um, Jonas, what is your take on this kind of, how do we avoid this zero forecasting problem that Alexander outlines here with this machine learning system? Um, so the, the zero forecast is really uh, the sort of things that you get when you do not um, uh, remove the stock out bias, which, which can be very super strong, essentially, 
you run out of stock, then you observe zero sales, but and and you confuse that with zero demand. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one point. Um, so and and I did actually present in one of the recent lectures how to deal with that. Uh, uh, we have actually at Locat we have at least three techniques in production to deal with the stock out bias. Um, uh, and I, I presented one which consists in changing the metric. So you, you change the very metric uh, 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 that you're optimizing against your forecasting model. So the model, the model itself, the forecasting model mm -hmm. is unchanged. You just essentially zero out the, 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 the points where you, you have your stockouts. What metric is typically used initially that you say we should change from? Essentially, a, a metric that it just applies uniformly whether you have stock or not. You know, that's that's essentially can your, you your give baseline. An example? Uh, that's literally you have a metric that can be any shape or form. There are like thousands of metrics. Let's say the, the simplest one would be L1, L2, whatever. Um, Mappy, if you want, although Mappy is like very, very weird. Um, so essentially, the question is that do you apply that uniformly across time? And part of the answer is no, you typically don't want to apply it uniformly. You want to zero out your uh, measurement on days where you have stockouts. That's a very crude approach. There are better, mm -hmm. different approach uh, to, to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. So the, the zero out, you mean uh, to... Uh... To essentially um, uh, remove... Um, contribution. Mm -hmm. The contribution of a yeah. day where you had a stock out. So kind of cut out the signal from those yeah, days. Yes, so that so basically you say I have a, a day where I know that my signal is heavily distorted. I just remove that. Yeah. It mm -hmm. it works until it works fine, but uh, not if your stock outs happen to be very prevalent. Um, for many, I would say for many businesses. Stockouts are re statistically relatively rare. They have like 95% mm -hmm. plus service level. So this sort of method works well if stockouts are somewhat exceptional. So kind of in, say, we have a natural disaster that happens quite rarely, which No, no, I mean, just, just like, let's say, a general products. merchandise store, you know, your supermarket, they have 95% s service level plus, you know, every single day. That's fine. Where it would not work, that would be, for example, for a store um, of hard luxury, for example. In this case, um, a store of hard luxury, just to give you an idea, you would typically have, let's say, 500 articles out of a catalog of 5,000. So by definition, you have like 90% plus stock out all the time. So in this case, it's not very sensical. So you see, it really depends on the industry. There are industries like, uh, for, for example, food, where uh, you expect very high service level, um, your assortment is is geared toward things that are, you're supposed to have. For example, your if your um, if your supermarket is usually selling um, a pack of, of of soda bottles, you should be able to walk in the store with confidence that you will find those units. Sometimes you won't, but those events will be rare. So again, it depends on the verticals mm -hmm. that you're looking at. Okay, and essentially the sales can send a wrong signal about the demand. Yes. Uh, like you explained, like if it's zero sales, it can just quickly be wrongfully assumed, well, that means zero demand, but in reality it could be because you don't have that stock. Mm -hmm. In fact, there is very high demand in that, and then that's mm -hmm. sort of an opposite. And the opposite yeah. is true as well. If you have a stock out for another product that happens to be a nice substitute, yeah, then you can see... Uh, the, the the sales for an item surge while actually it is just reflecting the mm. fact that you're running out of stock of something that is like a loose substitute mm. but nonetheless the, cl the 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 perception of the customer might be that it's a bad um that it's a bad service you see because yeah. um customers might still be okay to take for the substitute mm -hmm. but they might still think it is an inferior option so uh, uh so again what is interesting is that you have to consider the agent, you know, the mm -hmm. customers, what, what do they think mm -hmm. and, uh, and try to adjust your modelization of the demands to kind of capture the sort of basic, you know, 
uh, sort of line of thinking that is going to go into your customer base. How yeah. do we avoid this uh, zero forecasting problem so that zero sales isn't assumed to be zero demand? So Joanna has mentioned to just not take that signal into account to just avoid that sort of those days. Yeah, in technical um, terms, that's, yeah. that's called loss masking. So, yeah, loss you, masking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so you, you basically remove the contribution of mm -hmm. that, uh, that data point. Uh, another another uh, technique which is, is is very sort of straightforward is 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 um, where you in, yeah you also give the model access mm -hmm. to uh, stock levels historically but also maybe some future projections mm -hmm. of it. So uh, you can make sense of how this sales actually is influenced by. Yeah, the, the stock. model can then learn sort of what yeah. is the effect of certain stock level fluctuations on the future sales mm. for the month, uh, if, you, if you model it. Um, it's so essentially the effect of the decisions. Yeah, yeah, that's where I want, want to go. So where you sort of take all the decisions that have been made based on your T minus one forecast or your yeah. previous one, take all those decisions and you feed them as input to your forecasting model when you train it. Mm -hmm. And that's not only stock uh, decisions, so that impact the stock level, but it can also be marketing decisions mm -hmm. like uh, even a, a target set by the business steering that they say hey uh, this is how much we want to sell mm -hmm. that's a decision in itself because you have all these very market uh, forces yeah, yeah 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 market forces yeah yeah and that that you put all into the into the forecast as an, as an input uh, so promotions uh, uh, pricing data mm -hmm. uh, capacity data so mm -hmm. uh, uh, because, uh, like I explained in the beginning, capacity can also influence demand. If the lead times skyrocket, people go uh, find alternatives. So essentially, all the constraints all in the business, yeah, whether that's warehousing, manpower, everything. Everything that can, everything, yeah, yeah, everything that can affect demand mm -hmm. as an input signal to your model, and then the model can learn from history what the effect of these signals is on the demand, mm -hmm. and therefore correct for it. Um, this is this is a for the sort of step two sort of in your modeling because mm -hmm. then you're still not there. There's there's a lot of um, things you have to be wary about here. Um, uh, you, usually, what happens as an interesting sidestep is that uh, business users want to then use your model to do what is called in technical terms causal inference. Is when they start start a sort of tweaking things like what happens if we do this promotion or if we mm. reduce the stock levels what happens with demand then? kind of like a simulation yeah like way? a simulation um, uh, so they want to infer the causal effect of a certain mm -hmm. demand driver on the demand and for this to work you need to do uh, actually uh, a, 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 take a lot more care in the modeling uh, because if you do it in the way that I explained it uh, you can easily have your model learn uh, effects like um, uh, uh, that when the stock is uh, low, that mm -hmm. the uh, demand is high, uh, bec uh, just because mm -hmm. some marketing campaign, which is the actual cause, yeah. uh, sort of made that the stock went down and the uh, demand so went up. So it confuses the consequences. Yeah, that's called a confounder, or uh, and there's also the effect of reverse causality here, mm -hmm. where uh, because your demand went up, your stock went down. So these kind of and 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 uh, it uh, misunderstands why. Yeah, so so yeah. a sort of very standard machine learning model not given all the information it needs mm -hmm. uh, will sort of make this kind of uh, mistake classical mm -hmm. example more maybe more uh, sort of uh, uh, more mundane is is, mm -hmm. is when you uh, uh, try to predict the weather whether it will become uh, hot weather you can you can predict that by the number of ice cream sales well of course that's that's yeah. a typical example <laughs> sort of uh, reverse causality but maybe uh, they cut their price down or had a, <laughs> a stock out or something and that therefore yeah that's, that was many, the actual reason but there's that, many mm -hmm, things possible mm -hmm. yeah yeah but but i mean uh so so that's what you have to be careful of but this is yeah. sort of a uh, a way to get started with sort of giving your model more information about the mm -hmm. decisions that were made upon it and make sure that sort of it learns mm -hmm. how to relate it. but uh, this will also become still pretty challenging for mm -hmm. the model itself to learn these relationships especially if if there's a lot of steps in between where you don't have data from like um, if you give a forecast and then it's not one-on-one -on -one that someone in the business will sort of take that and make decisions on it now mm -hmm. there will be information added there will be changes made by by, by planners in, in the business in a lot the of common different inputs. price yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and then you sort of that's out of your you're blind to that to some extent and then and then it becomes uh, again uh, problematic Very complex. Yeah. before we dwell into mm -hmm. 
how do we actually approach these new challenges faced mm -hmm. by now creating a machine learning, a smarter model mm -hmm. that outputs decisions and learns, as you mentioned, Alexander, how does every decision impact the business to therefore compare them and find what decisions should we take, not just forecast kind of this intermediate in between step. Uh, but before we, we dwell into that, uh, Jonas, um, we mentioned a bit earlier this zero mm -hmm. forecasting model, which is an important um, concept in this machine learning model. Um, what is the difference in forecasting uh, approaches that we take? So we do probabilistic forecast at low CAD. Mm -hmm. Does that help alleviate the problem with zero forecasting mm -hmm. and sort of amplify, uh, as we discussed, these deviations from the norm that just become mm -hmm. bigger, bigger mistakes? Um, how does for probabilistic forecasting change that? Mm -hmm. um, probabilistic forecasting is very interesting in this respect and more generally for the feedback, lo feedback loops from, I would say, for two completely different reasons. Um, the first one is, um, is the idea that we are going to uh, introduce um, a notion of essentially a fuzziness. So that's, that's, so essentially we try to be at least approximately correct as opposed to exactly wrong. And um, when it comes to those um, uh, situations with zero forecasts, for example, what happens is that when you have probabilistic forecasts, you acknowledge that what you're, the, the, the quality of the, inform the, uh, the information that you have tends to be, I would say, quite fuzzy. You, know, you, you, don't, you don't have like a perfect vision on what is happening. And thus, essentially, it is going to be much more difficult, numerically speaking, to mm -hmm. converge to an absolute confidence that the demand mm -hmm. is really at zero. So it's not that the, fo the poetic forecasting model is so much better. It is, it is just that it will be spread out mm -hmm. and it will avoid um, to essentially deadlock on this zero mm -hmm. position that is kind of done. Because it considers all the Yeah, just because it spread the probabilities across many values. Yeah. And when you, when you add into the mix the fact that you typically have um, strong asymmetries between uh, being able to serve or just, uh, I would say, being able to serve um, or missing you know, a, a unit to be served versus just keeping one extra unit in stock for one extra day. Typically, in, more, in many situations, you are very much in favor of keeping one extra unit for a, a day rather than take the risk of, of, uh, of facing a stock out. You know, the, there is a, obviously a trade-off, but the trade-off is very much geared toward higher service levels. Thus, what you get out, so that's the first reason out of those probabilistic forecasts, is a situation where you have probabilities that are kind of spread. You don't have you don't have your forecast, which is essentially your your numerical statement about the future that just collapse as swiftly toward a degenerate state, which is we are just saying that the future demand will be zero. This is it. It will it will it will I would say suffer problems. So if you have repeat stock out, you know probabilistic forecasting is not magic. You will most likely underestimate the actual future demand. However, um, you will most likely be more uh, avoid the inventory freeze of freezing mm -hmm. at zero just because you're still estimating that there is a, a non-zero probability of having one or two or three units of demand. So that's, that's I would say, the first argument. It is just that... It avoids amplifying into one direction. Yes, it's, it's also... Um, I mean, especially when we have feedback loops, situations are very, very difficult to control, you know, completely. So it's better to have something that does not pretend to have like complete mastery of everything. Again, this is not the movement of planets. We are talking of phenomenon where 30, 60% inaccuracy is nothing, you know, um, uh, is 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 nothing too surprising. So you, they, so we are talking of a degree of inaccuracy in the sort of numerical statement that we make about the future that are very high. So probabilistic forecasts at least give something that just reflect this enormous ambient, you know, uncertainty that we have. Again, we are trying to model. Um, humans, you know, people that can react, it's very, very difficult. And the first thing to acknowledge is that 
you're not in control. I mean, those people, those clients, those suppliers, those competitors, they are smart. They are playing their own games. You know, they, they are doing a lot of stuff. You, you, it, it would be, I would say, um, a bit of, of hubris to think, to claim that you can perfectly model whatever it's it's going to happen you know that's that would be foundation the 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 science fiction science fiction novel from asimov you know where you can have like a perfect statistical modelization of what the future of uh, of of large civilization it it is extremely difficult and and most likely unrealistic so probabilistic forecasting is also um, of high interest for a completely different reason, the second reason. And the second reason is that unlike the point forecast where you have complete symmetry between the past and the future, and again, um, with point forecast, you have essentially, uh, let's say, one measurement per day, per skew, that would be your sales, for example, or your demand. And when you project into the future, you end up with one measurement per day, per skew. So the, um, the forecast is very much symmetrical of your past observation. What you, when you're looking at the future, you're looking at um, a, a piece of information that has exactly the same, I would say, shape compared to what you had in the past. However, when you are going into, I would say, the realm of probabilistic forecast, suddenly um, what you're looking at is a probability distribution or a series of probability distributions. And so you have this, this very this strong I would say asymmetry between the past and the future. Suddenly, the future is completely unlike the past. The past, you have uh, observations; they are only, you know, um, they are they are unique. There is no uncertainty, or or, or if they are, it's just uh, the uncertainty of the measurement itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, there might be a clerical error in your in in the record of your sales, but this is in terms of order of magnitude, this is very very small. This can be almost almost always approximated in supply chain as no uncertainty compared to the future where the uncertainty is vast and that's your priority distributions. And thus, uh, what is very interesting and that brings me to the feedback loop is that the feedback loops, it's yet another extra sort of, of dimension. It's a way to enrich the forecast to make it, to make it more but in a way that is very different because um, if probabilistic forecasting was about to introduce probabilities, uh, the feedback loops, it is, um, it is about making the forecast uh, what is technically known as a higher order function. So it's fundamentally, your forecast is suddenly not a result, not even a probability distribution. It is uh, a mechanism in which you can inject, you know, a policy, a sort of a reaction, and you will get a different outcome. So you see, it, it becomes somehow something where you just know that if somebody acts, and this somebody can even be yourself in a certain way, you will steer the situation in a specific way. But you see, it becomes, it is not static anymore. Probabilistic mm -hmm. forecast, even if you have probabilities, it is fundamentally something that is static. Uh, when you go into the realm of feedback loops, you have something that is uh, dynamic in a way that needs uh, at its core like a, a functional ingredient as in a function, a policy, you know, a policy as in uh, what am I going to, how am I going to react in terms of, of stocks, in terms of price, in terms of different things. And that will represent my forecast. And suddenly, I would say the, the forecast becomes much more elusive because it is not, um, I would say, a simple object anymore. But it does affect the forecast for those outputs through those feedback loops. But the, it's, it's more like the, the forecast, again, when people say the forecast, what they think is literally point forecast. As soon as we go into the realm of probabilistic forecast, we are already stretching what people can think of mm -hmm. when we say it is going to be probability distributions, so then it becomes much harder to visualize. To navigate. But if I say that your forecast is conditional to your future behavior, so then it becomes very fuzzy. And I'm not, you know, thinking of things that are ex extravagantly complex. Just, for example, the fact that your prices are going to evolve to, you know, um, to help 
keeping the flow of your goods through your supply chain. So if you uh, if a company is about to suffer a massive so shortage, the most natural obvious answer is just to keep raising the price gradually so that you hit the shortage uh, in a way that is less hard, I would say. You know? Conversely, if you're about to uh, suffer a massive overstock situation, the natural re uh, response is to lower the price to help you know, uh, increase the demand and liquidate this, um, this overstock. But you see, so, so the forecast that you have about the future depends on your pricing policy in those two examples. And thus, when you start thinking about those feedback loops, essentially, your forecast, there is no such thing as one forecast. It's, it's the forecast become conditional it takes into to account a the policy decisions. which yeah. is under your control to some extent. Alexander, do you agree with the sort of strength and differences John has just outlined with a probabilistic forecasting approach contrary yeah. to a time series one? Yeah, so uh, if, we, if we, I explained how sort of giving your model access to these previous decisions like yeah. pricing yeah. Uh, so can, can alleviate your, your, this issue. And um, uh, Johannes talked about sort of time series and probabilistic forecasting in that uh, respect. Um, but we, we don't only have this uh, effect of your sort of forecasts uh, uh, affecting their future sort of Decisions. decision yeah. and training data. We also have what's called partial observability. What is that? That is that you, uh, you only observe the effect of the, the decision, decision that's that taken. Yeah. So uh, you don't know what would have happened if you sort of had more capacity or more stuff. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a, uh, what's called counterfactual. So the challenge here is to create a model that's good enough to sort of accurately predict the impact of all the decisions? Well, well, that's where, where it sort of goes to. But, but you can, this, this, this phenomenon uh, is, 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 is very well known in, in e-commerce recommendation systems. It's, it's, uh, and arguably less so in supply chain. It's where you sort of, uh, it's called bandit feedback. So it's like a, the, the term comes from the multi-armed bandits, a slot machine setup in, in, in the casino where you, you only observe the reward that you get from the slot machine, which arm you pull. And then that's the same effect. And there, the, the recommendation system is similar to that because if you show a certain advertisement, you don't know what would have happened if you would have shown a different one mm -hmm. to the customer. And uh, there have been specific modeling approaches which sort of really are well suited to this. And the, the naive sort of supervised learning session uh, uh, setup that I talked about uh, in the beginning is actually where this falls short. So this is what is not good at sort of predicting this effect of the action. Uh, rather, what you want to do is you want to sort of reframe your machine learning problem in that uh, the model should not output a prediction about the future. It should mm -hmm. output a optimal decision. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think Johannes alluded to as well. It's, it's called a policy. So it's sort of, sort of you, you, you learn a model that says this is what you should do. And this is the ad that you should show. Or in supply chain context, this is the stock you should move from A to B. This is the amount of capacity you should reserve. So the actual things that yeah. directly affect your supply chain rather than yeah. a forecast on its own from which you then yeah, have yeah, to take yeah. a decision on your own and that the machine doesn't know which decisions you took. Yeah. And in theory, you could actually completely skip the whole forecasting. You can just mm -hmm. sort of say, this is what you should do. And um, uh, there are specific uh, machine learning uh, algorithms and, 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 and the, 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 the broader class is actually called reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. So that's where you take an action in the real world, you observe the effect of that, and uh, what's, which is then called, you could, should frame it in, in terms of reward, financial reward. Or, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's then you get, you get the feedback and then you update your model based on that feedback. You mentioned financial reward. So is an example if, say, you make the decision to order this much stock and then you observe how the supply chain performed that, how much money came into the account, and then that is then fed back into the system so it understands, well, when we took this decision, this was the output. And so it yeah. continues from that? Yeah, well, that, that sort of financial... Uh, like reinforcement uh, Financial sort of way. objective can be more complex, taking into account uh, mm -hmm. storage costs, uh, missed opportunities, uh, whatnot. So there's, 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 there's a lot more to it. To yeah. consider, yeah. we, can, we can elaborate on that mm -hmm. or we can keep it at that. But uh, um, uh, yeah, so that's what, what you then optimize with this sort of reinforcement uh, learning algorithm. Uh, and uh, yeah, that way you sort of directly learn uh, 
the policy, sort of the decisions you mm -hmm. should output. So yeah. you kind of more embrace this self-fulfilling prophecy rather yeah. than avoiding, which we yeah. did start to talk about in the very beginning of our discussion. So a way to, you mentioned as well, Giannis, it's not good or bad, it just cannot be ignored. And that is a way to, to bypass this, to, to have a dis, uh, model that takes into account the decisions yeah. and learn from the impact of previous decisions to create better and better decisions. Yeah, although we should sort of uh, think a bit about the implications of that, because uh, that means you should also mm -hmm. be able to sort of experiment. And that is in, in, in this setup, of course, very challenging if you need the model needs mm -hmm. to sort of learn and see what happens if it does A or B. Yeah. And, uh, so why hasn't this been essentially applied yeah. before? Or it's yeah. not applied everywhere. Yeah, well, this is one of the reasons. And, 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 and also, you, typical reinforcement learning algorithms uh, are learning in an online fashion, as to say. So they, they, they do an action, they take mm -hmm. an action, and then they learn from the reward feedback they get from that. And um, this is, like I explained, problematic in, 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 in real world settings where there's a lot of risk involved. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you don't have uh, you don't have something to sort of start this algorithm with, sort of to make it output sensible things in the first place. It sort of mm -hmm. starts randomly initiated. Um, uh, or you need to sort of have a very uh, good simulation environment, which is what you often see in other reinforcement learning settings like uh, uh, AlphaZero learning to play yeah, chess yeah. from Google DeepMind. They have a simulation, so they have a computer simulation where the, this reinforcement learning algorithm can can play around. So you don't essentially sacrifice someone else's supply chain. To, exactly. To be the exactly. First yeah, sort of yeah, yeah. Trial bunny. But to this get is a right chicken decision. egg thing in, 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 in our in our case here yeah. because then you need a very accurate model of the reality, and if you have that, then you already have solved the yeah. problem. So you need a supply <laughs> chain in the first place to do <laughs> yeah. that, and you don't want to do that. You need a model you of your model supply chain, and if you have that, you already uh, you should be, you should not need to train, and yeah. you should already yeah. be able to figure out the optimal we'll be setup. back to sort yeah. of where we started. Yeah, uh, but uh, there is a promising uh, direction nowadays where you learn from historical uh, data. It's called offline reinforcement learning, mm -hmm. where you basically learn from historical decisions that are taken, even though they are not as sort of, uh, yeah, nicely uh, spread as you would have liked them to be. It's still possible to train algorithms based on real-world data uh, that has been gathered previously. Like a starting point. Like a starting point, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And uh, from there, you can then uh, go without sort of sacrificing your supply chain. Yeah, to more online mm -hmm. settings, or you train it offline uh, and, and, be, and, and before you sort of release it in batches. Mm -hmm. There are several options there. But also, this comes with its own challenges. Uh, uh, Jonas, what is your take on, on what Alexander just described? Starting offline, uh, learning from previous uh, data, and then essentially the machine kind of bypasses this chicken egg problem, becomes good enough to be applied to a real supply chain, therefore has more kind of real data to work with and, and go on from there. What is your take on this? Um, data efficiency is almost always a concern for any kind of machine learning algorithm in, in supply chain because you you, you never have almost the luxury of having you know, uh, a gigantic amount of data, at least not at the granularity at which the decisions need to be made, you know, because in supply chain decisions need to be taken typically at the skew level. And, uh, and due to the fact that you have batching that takes place, even, um, even if we are looking at the skew in a store, it's not going to be millions of units per day. And if we are looking at the skew in a factory, then there will be big batches and it will be by batches of, let's say, 10,000 units. And again, it's not going to be millions of batches per day. So the amount of, of, uh, of relevant observation is still relatively limited. So that's, that's one aspect that is always a challenge. So indeed, for um, reinforcement learning, that is a challenge because we don't have uh, that much data. A simulator is uh, of very high interest, but uh, it was also a point that I, I briefly touched in one of my lectures is that essentially, there is a duality between a, between essentially a poistic forecast and a simulator. If you have a if you have a, a, a poistic forecast, you can always sample observation, and thus you get your simulator out of your poistic forecast. And if you have a, a simulator, you can just run many simulation and and then compute the respective probabilities, and you're back to your poistic forecast. So it, it's there is a very strong duality. So yes. Uh, that is interesting, but that relies on having a very accurate probabilistic mm -hmm. forecast, which is very difficult. And then the partial observability is a specifically tough nut to crack, because indeed, um, 
when you take a, a data set, let's say, for example, you want to um, investigate price movements, the company might have operated in a specific way for the last decade where they were not doing price movement at random. They, were, they, they, they had very strong habits, for example, and sometimes the habits are so strong that it creates problem when it comes to actually differentiate uh, what is the actual cause of something. For example, what if um, the company at every single, every single year at, let's say, end of January decide to have the first beginning of year sales. And so they do, uh, uh, um, they have a practice where they, they add big discounts across a large variety of products at the end of the month, January. Question, you will observe a surge of demand at the end of the month or of January. But what is the effect of the seasonality? So would they observed uh, a, a spike of demand, you know, at the end of the month, even without the discounts? Or, um, and what is the, the, the proportion of the impact of, that comes only from the discounts? And you see, so that's, um, that's the problem is that indeed the decisions were not, the, were not taken randomly. And so what you observed reflect uh, quite extensively the, um, the usual practices. And, uh, and, uh, and just like uh, uh, Alexander was describing, one way in reinforcement learning to tackle that is to introduce a mix of exploration versus exploitation. Uh, ex exploitation is you do the best from what you have observed, based on what you've observed, and exploration is that you try something new, but with the expectation that, because it is partially random, it will be inferior. So why would you ever try something that you know is most likely going to be inferior? The answer is, well, because it's the only way that ultimately you can discover something that turned out to be superior. Mm -hmm. So you see, that's, that's the idea of this exploitation. Sacrificing, essentially. So yes, it's, yeah. it's investment as in, you know, investment for research and development. And that could be something where, it, and it's not necessarily something that is, uh, that, that can take forms that are very mundane. It could be, for example, that let's say you're in a store, you're selling candles, and you realize that what if you were trying to sell the, the same candles, but at a price point that were four times higher or four times lower? You know, both options may be valid. Maybe if you go for very big bulk order from one of your supplier and you vastly increase the quantity, you could potentially vastly lower the price of you know, a basic product. I'm, I'm taking a candle on purpose. So you could have a much lower price and maybe you would multiply the demand that you observe by 10. So that would be you know, a worthy trade-off. Or go the other row, the other, uh, to change your path completely and say, I'm going to go for something that is much more premium and add flavor or fragrance and something else, a better packaging and multiply the price by four. And instead of having a tenth of the demand that I used to have, I still have half of the demand, but for a product that has a much higher price. However, if we look at the history, most likely the variation that we have observed were just small variation compared to the baseline, not... So our history doesn't encompass these more crazy, if you wish, scenarios. Yes, and, and again, it can be about what if you take a product and say, I introduce five variants of five different colors. You know, what is the degree of cannibalization that I will observe? Or I am actually touching new markets. Again, uh, if I take candles, and if I say that I'm going to introduce multiple colors for candles, to which degree will those candles of different colors will cannibalize themselves? And to which degree will I actually uh, fulfill entirely new demand? I don't know. And maybe I the historical data might give me some glimpse of this, but to a large extent, usually what we see is that as long as, I mean, until companies started to introduce some kind of machine-driven randomness, usually there is very little randomness. It's, it's, it's much more a matter of habit patterns. And again, it also boils down to the way those companies operate. When, for example, there is a, a pricing decision, it's typically not just uh, a person who just came up with the idea. 
there is like a method to it. And, and people have been trained and say, in this sort of situation, you should be discounting the product because it's the usual practice and it makes sense. And it's fine, but it also means that most of the price variation that you observe in the historical data always follow, I would say, a small number of patterns that are precisely the method that are in place. But surely that's still good, a good starting point, though, when, as you mentioned, what do you do else? So either you sacrifice the supply chain or you create a great simulation, but that is also based on the idea that you do have good data to go off on. Uh, but as Alexander mentioned, if we do it in an offline way, that we do look at our the existing sales history or you know data that we have, even though the you mentioned there there can be this downfall that we don't might not see this huge deviation from the norm to observe the different um, consequences of that. It's still. Is that the, still the right starting point in your opinion? Uh, I believe that the, the, the right starting point is slightly different. The right starting point is first to acknowledge that whenever we have feedback loops, this is fundamental. And if we acknowledge that those feedback loops are real and we want to tackle them, it is a change of paradigm in the way we approach forecasting itself. And you see, that's the real starting point. The rest is technicalities. There are plenty of, of models. The simplest reinforcement learning models like Bandits can be incredibly simple. Some are incredibly complex, but those are technicalities. The, the, what I observed in real world supply chain is that the biggest challenge to actually start embracing something as simple as those feedback loops is to acknowledge that it will actually have deep consequences on the forecasts themselves. The forecasts are never going to be the same. And I'm not saying quantitatively, I'm saying in terms of paradigm, you cannot look at those forecasts the same way. This is not even the same object anymore. This is something of a different nature. And that's, and that's, that's very difficult because usually the question that I get is that, will, will be my forecast more accurate? And one of the challenge is as soon as we start looking at those feedback loops is that accuracy, how do you even measure accuracy when you have feedback loops? That's a whole, you know, question of its own. Yeah. It's a difficult question. Yeah, if I can tie into that, I think sort of we've been discussing the technical challenges and data availability challenges. Uh, but I think indeed, I, I completely agree with you, honestly, that the the main reason also why uh, it hasn't been, applied, has been yeah. adopted in like enterprise settings is, is also that it has a profound impact on your business process. So in this sort of theoretical setting where we want to make this work, you should have sort of plugged this AI then directly into your business process and let it steer your entire operation. Mm -hmm. Well, this is obviously a, a, a bridge too far in, in many settings, even if you would have the perfect policy trained on historical data or whatnot. Or, uh, so, so that is sort of a... A, 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 an organizational or a culture change or a, a business process change that that needs to happen and, and and that brings us back with the sort of the whole the whole starting point of mm -hmm. this feedback loops being there and and and, and being the first st step is to embrace that it exists and to sort of incorporate it in the modeling mm -hmm. in a way and then start building from there uh, yeah so to conclude this a little bit so we we have to embrace the fact that we do have these self-fulfilling prophecies, not good or bad, but they are there. Um, a way around, well, the first step, as you mentioned around it, is to have a model that outputs decisions that look at the impacts of the decision rather than something midway like forecasts that people then have to make, make decisions off. Um, and then when it applies in practice, we do have a lot of challenges uh, to still bypass, which is why it hasn't been widely adopted yet, such as what data is good enough? How do we approach this sort of chicken egg problem with, do we have a simulator that's good enough? Do we do, as you say, Johannes, these more unwanted decisions or decisions that feel wrong? Like, do we four times the price that we cut the price and see the effect of that. So essentially figuring out a way to how do we make the model understand and learn from, you know, essentially mapping out all the possible decisions that can happen and the impact of them, even decisions that we don't want to take because we don't want to risk having a catastrophic effects on this. Um, and so conclude this a little bit is essentially after that first step one, what is the right sort of approach forward now? Um, where do we where do we steer this technology when it comes to supply chain industry? 
Yeah, so um, I, I think sort of it starts with, uh, like I said before, uh, acknowledging uh, that these feedback loops are there. Yeah. And secondly, to think about how do you then take that into account in your forecast or even go towards approaches where you output a decision directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's all about moving there in, in small steps because the business... Changing mice is probably... Cha yeah. Changing small uh, things in the business process to move closer towards those decisions that you're, you're actually affecting. Mm -hmm getting the data from these decisions. Uh, this is the way forward for, uh, for that large... That will already increase our sort yeah. of relevant data yeah. sets and yeah. stuff. And that is true because we do see that the fact that looking at the decisions as the main output rather than forecast is still not widely adopted at all. We see, you know, essentially everyone comes to us looking for, oh, can you make better forecasts? Yeah. Because our stuff is not going as we want. So clearly it's the forecast that's wrong. But in reality, well, the forecast does not affect your supply chain. It's the decisions that you make. And yeah. a forecast, well, it's it's good if it's considered good. It's if, if the future happens to sort of be around that, but it's considered bad if the future doesn't happen to be around that. It's not, never question how the forecast was essentially first created. Um, and Giannis, in sort of in your views as a step, what is the next step towards this rather than just well, adopting mindsets and going step by step, what is your sort of take on how this is going to be adopted in, in the sort of nearest future, where the trend is going to go? The trend is, I believe, if I look at the very aggressive, uh, technologically minded players, so that would be the GD.com, the Amazon.com, yeah. the Alibaba.com, you know, those e-commerce uh, who are um, ahead uh, of their game they're, they're, yeah. yes they are really on, on top of their games they are very very effective and in terms of supply chain they are reinventing themselves every couple of years which yeah. is quite impressive considering that those companies are not startups anymore they are like a yeah <laughs> multi dozens of billions of, of of euros or dollars you know uh, companies what I see is that essentially um, they have let go they, they have managed to let go the idea of um of the perfect forecast of the one forecast of that the gives you yeah. the the i would say a crystal clear vision about the future and that is that is a, sli a slightly a paradox but if you want to be i think that the lesson is that if you want to be more efficient for your supply chain more effective is to accept uh a form of forecast that is not as pure, you know, that is not just as, that doesn't have this crystal clarity of, of being the pure symmetric of your past, um, to have something that involves, you know, probability, so it becomes mm -hmm. fuzzy, Embracing that improves the uncertainty. Um, higher order functions, so, which is a, a, a very fancy way to say, uh, have a way to include those, um, those feedback loops, those policies to to model your own reaction to future events even if it's very crude uh, but all of that requires to kind of give up on the idea that you can completely control the future and um, and I believe that what I mean with our clients we are moving toward that it is not that I would say complicated the technologies again the first numerical recipes can be very TV straightforward it doesn't have to be exceedingly complex however um, it is i would say it, um, it is a decade long undertaking to essentially undergo all the transformation that are associated with letting go the classic forecasting perspective you know the, the classic forecasting perspective is still incredibly prevalent the idea that you can just have your one battle plan and all is just a pure matter of orchestration it may have worked that way a few decades ago, when it was the market was purely a market of essentially um, of that was constrained on the supply side. You know that was after World War II reconstruction. Basically, all industries needed to produce more, and the only limit was how much you could produce for pretty much everything. That was a word that was very very simple. But nowadays, uh, we are not living in this world. We haven't been living in this world for quite a long time. And um, and uh, um, the world is still progressing, but I'm pretty sure that you know what has happened during the last couple of years just proved that we are not at the end of history where everything would become super predictable. 
The world keeps being chaotic for reasons that are still very surprising. But the only thing that is not surprising is that there are still surprises that keeps coming up. And uh, we have to embrace the uncertainty. Is that yes, right? embrace the uncertainty. Yeah. Embrace also the, the the irreducible complexity of of humans. You know, supply chains. It's essentially big combinations of humans plus machines plus processes, and um, and and the idea that you can put all of that under complete control is um, arrogant to some extent. So again, my approach is more like being approximately correct to have something that will very roughly capture all of that. Rather than exactly uh, wrong. Rather than exactly wrong, where you, 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 you pretend that you will be able to capture all those behavior of those people who might actually decide to do just the opposite, just you know to make you suffer. That's a sort of joke when you have somebody walk into a store and they are going to look at all the products to take the one product that has the longest expiration date. You know, that's an adversarial behavior mm -hmm. so that you have people that are adversely going to uh, go against what would be, you know, most favorable mm -hmm. for the store in mm -hmm. terms of expiration date. Very interesting take there. Uh, Giannis, and like a final sort of wrap up thought, um, Alexander, when it comes to sort of what we've described today, what kind of... Um, I guess talents or specific qualities in people do you look for to when you onboard new people onto your team that are sort of in the right mindset to sort of push this tech forward? Yeah, yeah. So the, in IKEA, we're working on the, the things we discussed, so uh, how to solve these challenges. And we're always looking for uh, great data science uh, talent to, uh, to solve these issues in, mm -hmm. in a big, uh, big corporation. So yeah, that is uh, that's always uh, a lot of interesting mm. stuff, a lot of data, a lot of potential lot of data, to yeah. to have impact on global scale. They're so, ready uh, to challenge the status quo. And yeah, exciting, exciting yeah. times. Yeah. All right. Um, well, thank you very much on behalf of both Jonas and I. It was a real pleasure to have you with us here today. Yeah. And thanks for having me. My pleasure. <laughs> Guest starring at Look TV. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>